that country wasn't prepared for war. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has launched a major military operation against Ukraine. Putin and his regime's desire to rebuild the Soviet state. The Ukrainians woke to explosions lighting up the dawn sky. Men dragged out in front of their families and executed. You're joking, mate. No, mate, this is the oh, worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Russian armoured personnel carriers and other military vehicles crossed the border from Belarus into Ukraine. Is he just brainwashing the Russian people? His position in Russia is that Russia is fighting for its own survival against NATO. And he's using that as the the method to keep his his people under control. That this is like Russia against the world. Now, if Putin loses that war, he loses control of Russia. And that's the end of his presidency and probably the end of his life. Sharpie, welcome back to the show, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me back, bud. Yeah, um, we're looking forward to this one. And... Um, I know I've been on your case about what you've been up to over the last seven or eight months and you've been talking about, you know, certain things you've said to me and uh, certain things you're not allowed to say and what have you uh, mm. over the phone. And to get you back in the studio now, I want to find out exactly what's been happening with you personally over the last seven and a half months. Yeah. Uh, so obviously the war in Ukraine kicked off in February um, and like a moth of the flame, I was uh, I was drawn out to Ukraine first week of March and then yeah, you were you were on the phone. I was like... <laughs> Not much we can say right now, maybe I'll keep a low profile. <laughs> I didn't want to get too far up Putin's uh, yeah. radar at the time. Yeah. But, you know, the months have gone on, lots has happened. And uh, the reason I reached out to you was that the war in Ukraine's moved on from the news here, but it hasn't moved on there. And it's important that people that can talk about it start talking about it because we need to keep the right amount of attention on it. Because, yeah, the war's in Ukraine, but it, it's affecting the whole world. You yeah. know, you know it's, it's making a big difference back here in the UK and everywhere else. So, that's what I was like, all right, mate, I'll put my head yeah. back above the parapet. Yeah, yeah. Mate. Well, I really do appreciate that. Just just rolling back a bit then. So what actually happened on that sort of Fe February 25th this year, wasn't mm. it? February 25th. What actually happened to say, right, the war has kicked off? Well, if you guys remember um, sort of the two-week lead-in, three-week lead-in, Russia was amassing troops on the border, 100,000 troops on the Belarusian border and on their uh, Ukrainian border. And no one really thought it was going to happen, you know. But then the American embassy evacuated two weeks before, and then people were like, mm, maybe it will. But no one actually thought we were going to see a state-on-state -state invasion like that. Two developed countries going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Then woke up in the morning, and what, 05 on the 25th, he uh, he invaded. You know, they, they they went for Kiev. They came in through their uh, the eastern border of Ukraine as well, and a full air and land assault on a... On a sovereign country. How mad is that? Yeah, mate, I can't get my fucking like literally it. freaking madness. Surely, yeah. it's just been going on for years. Obviously, they've been they've been at each other since what 2014, 2015. Yeah, has it always been sort of boiling that one day this may happen? Well, I mean, Russia's. Um, so, you, if you go back to pre ninety one, the USSR and the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine was obviously part of the USSR. Yeah. And in ninety one, post Chernobyl, when the Soviet Union fell apart, Ukraine voted for independence from Russia. But Russia, certainly Putin, very imperialistic in his view. He has these historical claims across everything that used to be the USSR in in his view. Yeah. And so that tension's been building for a long time. And because, you you know, when you draw a boundary through any country, just because you draw a boundary doesn't mean that necessarily all those people suddenly aren't or aren't of a nationality. Yeah. So in the Luhansk and Donbass regions um, and in Crimea, where they met in 2014, they speak Russian, you yeah. know, so most people in the east of Ukraine speak Russian. That's the predominant language. Um, and so you get that cultural sort of blurring that we don't get here in England because yeah. we're an island. But, you know, on the European continent, sub certainly in Africa, you know, just because there's a border doesn't mean you're all different. Yeah. So that tension's always been there. The main thing is Putin and his regime's desire to rebuild the Soviet state. And that was the main tension. He's He's hidden behind the fact that he thinks... Ukraine are Nazis and that he's saving the Russian people from Ukraine. The best bollocks. Is he, is he just brainwashing the Russian people? Is he brainwashing yeah. them to say, you know what, the Ukrainians are bad, we don't like them, they're, they're Nazis, and is he just giving them anything they want to feed them the information that he's happy with? Yes, I mean, you're, everyone should have seen the propaganda war. This is the first time we've ever seen a war that's fought. It's still got men in trenches, shooting each other but it's also got all the modern technology and it's an open source intelligence war so osin propaganda social media they're attacking the fabric of society behind the war 
And he, he, his position in Russia is that Russia is fighting for its own survival against NATO. And he's using that as the, the method to keep his, his people under control, that this is like Russia against the world. Yeah. When it's not, it's, it's, his, it's his aims, it's his ambitions to retake this Soviet Union mm. and to leave his legacy. Mm. But yeah, I mean, when you see, uh, you know, I haven't met a Russian in eight months, but you know, when you see them on the news, they, they do buy into this. They believe that he is their defender well, actually, no one's attacking Russia. Yeah, yeah. Russia's attacking Ukraine and, yeah. and would not stop at Ukraine. If they yeah. roll through there, it'd be Poland, it'd be Estonia. You know, yeah. they, they would just keep marching through Europe. And just, just tell me, why are you involved? So when when I was last on here, this should be called the Sharpie and Dodge show. <laughs> <laughs> Part two. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about my, my background, crisis or response. Dodge and Sharpie show. <laughs> Sharpie and Dodge has got better than <laughs> <laughs> Um, my background's crisis response, um, humanitarian disasters. So my network is all in that world. So when the war kicked off, my phone was lighting up. People asking, yeah. how do we get logistics in? How do we get people out? How do we do evacuations? How do we move money inside yeah. the country? Moving money in these kind of things is always difficult. Yeah. So the phone's lighting up and, and I could sort of just see virtually in my mind all these people dotted around the map. And I was like, well, if I just go and put myself in the middle of that, um, I can probably do some good in yeah. the short term. I can help to, to like bring some coherence to all these individual people trying to do stuff. But there's probably an opportunity there to to do something long term. So, packed the truck, um, jumped in it here with my uh, my old business partner, and we just we just drove to Ukraine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man, I just can't get my head around that bit. <laughs> Pack the truck and just drive to Ukraine yeah. in the middle of a war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, it just seemed like what the right did you thing pack? To do. <laughs> swimming, swimming trials. Yeah. <laughs> Factor 50. No, we just, um, you're never quite sure what you're going to go into. So you've got to make sure you're self sustaining. So we put, we packed loads of um, fuel type protein powder, water, fuel, camping equipment if we needed it, enough kit just to, to, to live in, like field kit. Um, and then just jumped in the truck and, uh, and headed out there. Got to the Polish border, initially thinking it was going to be a refugee problem. Yeah. That was that was bad, but it was short lived. Mm. So we mounted in Poland for about a week, and then my partner stayed in Poland, and then I I headed off into Ukraine by yourself. Yeah. What we? <laughs> I'm trying to get my head around this. What do you do? Do you open up Google Maps and say, "Right, I'm driving to Ukraine by myself <laughs> in a truck"? Is, is that what's well, going on? Um, so the GPS signal was all jammed anyway. So Google would have been pretty intermittent. So it's paper maps, and then you're trying to create start points in a situation like this. So it's carnage, you know, the, that country wasn't prepared for war. Yeah. It probably should have been, but it wasn't. Yeah. And what you're trying to do is look at where all the known actors are. So people that are talking to you, where are they? Mm. Where, what kind of outcome do you think you're gonna to wanna to have? So we initially, after the refugee crisis, <clears throat> thought it was gonna be about getting aid into the contested areas. So where the Russians were already occupying, all the fighting was happening, we thought it was gonna be about getting logistics into there. Okay. So do a quick map recce. Um, Think right. We're going to need to go make connections in this area, and Ukraine is massive. Yeah. So to get from the Polish border to the contested space, it's about twenty four hours of driving. Okay. Um, through a country that's at war, that you know the checkpoints popped up everywhere. There's different villages being mobilised to be soldiers. So it's you know it's not as easy just driving straight. To and what you do as, as you're driving through there, have you got? A, a, I know you you were. One of the top dogs in the army and commander. As a Royal Marine, mean. Are we Royal Marine? I think you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you there with like you pulling out a badge to let you get through? Is there? How does it work? Were you trying to explain yourself? What was the language barrier like? Did they know who you were? What What went on? Yeah, so we got some um, papers off the Ministry of Intelligence initially. Yeah. Um, Ukraine's very old school in some ways. It has to be paper stamped, yeah. signed, really old fashioned. So we had papers um, to legitimise our a place there mm. but then you get to the checkpoints there's no English there's no English but um, spoken back so it's passport it's papers and then it's body language you know just yeah. you can communicate sometimes without words yeah. um, but you know we were getting pulled over all the time like, what, what, what are you doing yeah. here searching the truck all the time because uh, they were like really paranoid about Russian saboteurs this is like week five week six of the war they were paranoid but were you not paranoid at all well not so much you know we knew we weren't up to no good um, there's risk but no, we weren't paranoid. Yeah. Like we were pretty confident in what we were what we were doing. And then as soon as we start getting those start points, those connections, 
you start to gain influence quite quickly. Um, you get more papers, you get more access, you get passwords to get through stuff. Mm. So you've been to many other countries uh, uh, battling in wars, right? Mm. What was it? What was different about Ukraine? <laughs> it's like being here, mate. Mm. The, the weirdest thing is it's like, so Kiev is like being in London. Okay. The main street in Kiev looks like um, Oxford Street. Okay. You know, so the people look just like us. It's a super developed country. Um, but it's at war. So you'll be sitting in Kyiv or Lviv, like in the earlier days, or even down in Dnipro, and then it gets rocketed, you know. What's a nice shops, uh, restaurants, cafes, people yeah. enjoying themselves. There's 40 million people in Ukraine. Yeah. And is that obviously, as a capital, it felt like a capital? Well, it would have done before the war. Yeah. When I got there, yeah, what initially, was it like? empty. It like was empty. A ghost town. Everyone was, um, lots of people had evacuated. The only people left there were fighting age males. It was a hard curfew in it. So I'll say that again, roll back then. The only people that left there were what? Fighting age males. Okay. So they put martial law in. Yeah. So that um, fighting age males up to the age of 65 couldn't leave the country. So the Ukraine said from the age of what, 18 to 65? Yeah, that's right. Everyone had to fight for the country? Not everyone had to fight, but no one could leave. Okay. Because they were going to do conscription in four waves. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they're in the wave two at the moment. Because mm. they had a professional military as well. But no one, no man was allowed to leave in case they were going to be conscripted or they had to go and do other jobs inside the war effort, mm. you know, manufacturing, uh, driving, whatever it might be. And when you got there, was Ukraine, was their buildings blown up? How, how was it for you with those first few months? When did you really, when did it really kick off for you? So come across the Polish border, you're straight yeah. into Lviv. Yeah. And Lviv's really nice and it's been pretty much untouched. Again, it was empty, uh, really quiet. So we... We just sort of got our bearings there for a day or two, and then we headed east. And about every hundred clicks, every hundred kilometers east, you know, it get the threat level rises, yeah. and it gets more and more Soviet. You know, it's very western yeah. on that west side. Then every hundred kilometers, it gets more eastern. Yeah, it's like it's bizarre. You know, you can almost see it town to town. So once we got to like Ternopil, Venetia, mm. that's when we started experiencing rocket attacks. You know, okay. we're filling the truck up with diesel in this little. Uh, sort of shanty uh, diesel place and then yeah. the, the air station gets rocketed next to us. And then by the time we got to Uman, which is bang in the middle of the country and headed south for Odessa, that's when, you know, you really started to experience it then because that was, that was a full-scale assault at the time. Yeah. And what's that feeling like for you being in full-scale scale assault? Are you Have you got arms on you? You've got guns on you? You've got no. stuff on you? Nothing? No. Um, so you're, it, so you're, your own safety is at massive risk here, obviously. What were you trying to achieve? Um, so our own safety is at risk, but we also know how to operate in those environments. You know, we've been doing it all of our adult lives. It's um, it's about judgment. It's about being able to take risk well. You know, mm. not accepting it, taking it. So you make judgments. You can feel it. You yeah, know, you okay. get these spidey senses when things are too moody or yeah. not too moody, and then you push. And what we we're trying to achieve at the time was building our access into all of that eastern region for what we thought might come. Yeah. Um, you know, because we were, initially we were doing extractions and evacuations of people, but we were looking at the logistics play because we wanted to put the business there as well. You know, we wanted yeah. to um, put the platform in. So we were sniffing out what was going to be needed. And so to do that, we had to make the connections. So to do that, to earn the trust, we had to and go to, to the risky there. areas. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, being a former soldier, you can speak their language in terms of, war and we were willing to go into these different places, mm. get to the trench lines, meet the commanders, meet the local leaders and show that we're, we're in this. And also we're opening a Ukrainian company. So we opened yeah. a company there to say, look, we're not just coming here to make some money. We're yeah. here to help and we're here for the long term. Yeah. And what was it like when you saw the UK, Ukrainian army? Are they up to the standards of our army here in in the UK? Um, so the Ukrainian military is in, in different um tiers, if you like. So you've got the Ukrainian special forces, you know, bombers, you know, really tough, gnarly, like hard guys being fighting the whole lives. And then you've got the Ukrainian army, just the, the, their standard military, also really experienced because since 2014, they've been in a constant battle on the east there. So, yeah. you know, there's some experienced guys in that. Mm. But then what you've got is the terror hold defense units, which were just blokes like they were bakers, builders, teachers, whatever, mid-February, yeah. then they got mobilized to go and defend their villages. Wow. So they're in all kinds of yeah. kit and they're not soldiers. Yeah. They're learning pretty quick because mm. they've got to. And I mean, you can see they're, they're smashing Russia right now. Yeah. Um, so you've got different levels. But yeah, the professional military 
is professional. Mm. You know, they're, they're absolutely handing it to Russia right now. How many, just to explain what happened then. So the Russia's come in and invaded, mm. bombed all these major cities. And once they've bombed them, what do they, what's the next steps for them to do? Well, and this, that's the problem. So Russia thought they were going to take Ukraine in three days. Yeah. And I mean, they got close. If they took Kiev, this would have gone a very different way. But okay. Kiev defended itself. Yeah. You know? And that was just men and women with AKs and, you know, a really, really strong defence by the military. When you say strong defence, what does that actually visually look like? I'm trying to visually look, uh, visualise it. I'm in Kiev. It's a major city. We're going to get bombarded by a load of Russians turning up in mm. tanks and da da da. How are you defending? How is a woman and people with guns defending themselves there? When yeah. something can just blow up and, and, and blow another big building and take out a nursery and take out a school yeah. and take out all these things by pressing a, a few buttons here and there. You so, know? so Russia attacked Kiev from the north. They yeah. came in through Belarus, huge tank columns. And uh, there was a bridge 50 kilometers north, which luckily um, Ukraine blew the bridge, which slowed the tank column down, oh. which then kept them slightly off, which meant then the Ukrainian military could defend at range. So actually the, the perimeters of Kyiv never got breached. Yeah. You can see all the evidence of the fighting around the outskirts in the suburbs. And Bucha and Irpin, two cities to the north, got yeah. absolutely flattened by artillery and airstrikes. Yeah. But they never got into the city, um, which is very fortunate. But those northern towns, there's just nothing left. You know, yeah. they've just been completely flat. And that's where the, the first mass graves were found. You know, the first evidence of like horrific war crimes. Um, just the north of Kiev. So, talk to me about these mass graves because I've seen them on I've seen them on uh, on TV. Mm. Are they as brutal as they are on TV? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's hard to explain. Um, they just seemed like to me they were just holes with wooden crosses on each hole and throwing bodies in. Yeah, but of course, those ones where you see the wooden crosses—that's yeah. where the locals have tried to bury the dead with some dignity. It's yeah. a very religious country, yeah. like very religious. The The Russians weren't doing that. They were just leaving piles of bodies everywhere. You know, we're talking about like mass murder, mass weaponized rape, raping of babies, raping of children, raping of women, men dragged out in front of their families and executed. You're joking, mate. No, mate, this is my the God. worst thing I've ever seen in my life. My God. Yeah. And where, where, when this is all going on, are you like, I want to get closer to the action. I want to see what's going on from my own eyes. Yeah, not not because, um, not for my own enjoyment. No, but that's that's where you, that's where you find out the need. Yeah. So you have to you have to understand what's going on to be able to speak with any kind of credibility to be able to understand how to assist. Otherwise, you're just another armchair warrior, and there's yeah. plenty of them in the world. Yeah. So you have to get forward. Um, so I spent as much time as I can out in the east, visiting the different military units, getting into the trench lines, understanding what it is they're doing and what they're seeing, because that earns trust, like I yeah. said earlier, but it means I understand, so yeah. that I'm not then like a round peg looking for a square hole. Yeah. And are you are you coming back to the UK, giving them all the feedback for exactly what's going on? So we speak to the American government much more than the UK government. Um, Why the Americans? Because my, my partner in this is American, yeah. he's very well connected in that space. Yeah. Um, and, British politics has been in fair amount of turmoil recently, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, people are changing all the time, including prime ministers. So I haven't really been that engaged with the UK government till now, much more on the American side and a lot more on the Ukrainian side as well. And have you noticed a huge amount of investment coming in from the US and different countries, Poland, the US, the UK, shipping in tanks and, and missiles and everything for, mm. for, for the Ukrainians? Yeah, so when uh, the nearest airport to Ukraine, because Ukraine's airspace is obviously shut, you can't you can't fly into there. So Zhezhov is the nearest Polish airport, and that looks like a, a military base now. It's where you'd fly in for a, like a weekend break in Krakow, but yeah. it's now full of Patriot missiles, 82nd Airborne, and that's where all the the military, the lethal aid, as it's called, lands yeah. on. And yeah, I mean, lots and lots of that coming in. You don't see it moving in country because it gets broken down into discrete vehicle movements. So it doesn't get hit by Russia. Mm. But, um, you know, the 40 billion pledge from the States, they're about 15 billion into that at the moment. Because obviously it takes a long time to move that much material. So there's a lot coming in, but they need more. So you it's say like, it's coming in from the States. How is it coming in from the States? Where is it going to? What's the route? Well, they keep that secret, don't they? But I mean, it flies in by big Antonovs. Um, What's an Antonov? A huge military cargo plane, like massive, you know, that you can put a tank in. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, the biggest plane you'll ever see in yeah. life, yeah. 
um, so they, they're getting lots, but they're getting enough to like not lose. Yeah, My, okay. And the sense is that like, it's always just enough. It's never quite enough. And if you, I, I've noticed that, especially in the UK here, actually off the news that the Ukraine and the Russian uh, chat is not as much as it used to be. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's a, a shame that's because that, but what you're saying here is that it's still kicking off massive over there. But the actual news isn't shown as much as it should do. No, because if you remember when it kicked off, it was like 24 hours a day, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but the news moves. But the problem is that war doesn't move. And that war is so important to everything else that's happening in the world right now. Fuel prices, yeah. food prices, you know, the, the political instability in the world, mm. investors getting nervous, stock market fluctuate, you know, so much comes in and out of that war. You know, it's the breadbasket of the world. Yeah. So, you know, most of the grain comes out of Ukraine. Yeah. So starvation in Africa, the reason your loaf of bread's doubled in price, yeah. the reason it costs more to put diesel in the truck, you know, all these things yeah. stem from, from this war. And of course, we've got domestic problems here in the UK, like they have in the States, it's everywhere in Europe. Yeah. And it's, it's very easy to point the blame at the government. I mean, they've, they've made a fair few fuck ups. Yeah, but, yeah. but there's so much stems out of this war. Right. And if Russia wins this war, which I just don't think they can now, but if they did, mm. that affects all of us. Was there a point when you thought the Russians are actually going to turn over Ukraine? Oh, for sure. Um, I think we all did. Mm. Like, well, you know, on everybody. paper, listen, I'm, I'm not into war and whatever, but on paper I thought, God, the size of Russia, 140 million people, the size yeah. of Ukraine, 40 million people. Russia all over here is Putin's got this missile and got mass destruction yeah. and whatever. I didn't really hear much about Ukraine, so I didn't really understand that world. But the, when, when I saw Russia come into Ukraine, I thought... Oh my God, what's that going to lead on to next? Is it going to be then Poland? Is it going to be then Germany? Is it from Germany into, what does that look like for us? But actually what the Ukrainians have done, have stood their ground and fought back and pushed all the Russians back into their own country. Yeah. Well, because you, you're dealing with a, and we all overestimated Russia. I think we, we in the West have been overestimating Russia since the fall of the Cold War. We thought they were the world's second army. I think they've shown us that they're not. Their equipment is badly looked after. They're, they're ill-disciplined. Um, and they're conscripted, whereas you're dealing with men defending their families and their yeah. villages, yeah. you know, at the point, you know, you can never be more morally driven to fight than in that circumstance. With the people that you've spoken to in Ukraine who are on the front line, proper proper soldiers have been there, like yourself, been there and got it, got the T-shirt. What's their attitude like? Oh, it's like, it's unreal. The resilience, not just them, but all of the Ukrainian people. When you're watching them trying to live their normal lives and you're seeing young kids out on dates and you're seeing people getting married still every day and you're seeing these soldiers that are living in trench lines in front of their houses like their desire to fight mm. and to maintain their freedom because they've got cossack heritage and in like in that culture like land and freedom means way more to them than it would ever do to to like me and you yeah you know it means everything to them yeah and have you met Russian soldiers when you were out there? No. No, okay. No. Because I wonder what their attitude's like. Have they been brainwashed to just go and take out Ukraine? Are they young kids or 18 to 20 and they, they've been trained up in a way, but they haven't been trained in such a uh, a sort of streamlined way that the British mm. military have been or the US military? Yeah. Is it? I, I, I'm just intrigued to know how many sort of these young soldiers, how many have lost their lives in Ukraine? I mean, the... The loss of Russian life in Ukraine is, is huge. I mean, I've, I've lost track now, but we over 40,000 soldiers. Um, Just? In Ukraine. Wow. Russians, you yeah. Know. Um, and Ukrainians? How many Ukrainians have died, that, they say? It's hard to tell. Is, that's, yeah. that's not a very well publicized number, obviously. Yeah. Um, less though, but still significant. The, whilst the Ukrainian military will have had less loss, it's the Ukrainian civilian loss of life, which will be just ginormous. Yeah. Um, but you know, Russia, does a, a twice yearly mobilization. So it conscripts twice a year. And what, do you, very, mean, what do you mean by that? So um, every every Russian man has to do national service. National service, okay. And so every two years, there's a mobilization, there's a call up for the next wave of national service. Okay. And they go through training. And is that an age thing? So like the Russians yeah. there, well, they say 18 to 22, you're, you're now. And yeah. then there's another one, what, 21 to 26, yeah. you're now. So however, how it works? Okay. however they bracket it. Okay. Um, but at the moment they're mobilizing 65, 70 year olds, they're mobilizing people out of prison. There's 300,000 you saw in the news. Yes. They're just taking 300,000 men from anywhere in Russia. And certainly in like the poorer provinces, no training, very old equipment, you know, 100 year old equipment onto the front line, but they're just feeding them into a meat grinder. 
Um, so that mobilization doesn't really worry anyone because they're not they're not soldiers. Yeah. They're people How does that make you feel? It. Like being the elite of the elite, and you see this and go, "That's a massive weakness." Okay, they've got mass people, but have they got actually got them the armory to do it? Have they got the know how? Are they bang on the ball and sharp in in, in going to end re-entering back into Ukraine? And also, you're about to come into like a really freaking cold winter. Yeah. What happens now? Like, does yeah. everyone just stop for the time being? The winter will naturally freeze the conflict, no pun intended. But like the the intensity right now in the counteroffensive is to get as much of Ukraine back before the winter will naturally slow the war down. And then it'll go back into an artillery exchange. They'll just keep chucking artillery to each other over the contact line, ready for then the spring offensive. Um, but, the, you know, the way Ukraine's fighting at the moment could have huge chunks of those annexed places back before the winter sets in. So if it's a late winter, so if the snow holds off till like the end of November, yeah. we could see two more regions get retaken at this rate. And, and you say that. How many regions have been taken? So Russia's just annexed four. So Luhansk, Donbass, Zaporizhia and Kherson. So it's the two big regions are called oblasts on the east. Yes. And it's the two big ones on the south. They never got as far as Odessa, yeah. Mykolaiv and Odessa, yeah. which is their big goal because that gives them a warm water port because the Russian ports freeze up. Okay. So the reason Odessa is important is it doesn't freeze in the winter. So that would give them constant access from the sea. Right, okay. But they never got that far. So those four have just been annexed in that sh um, sham you referendum. You say annexed, what do you mean by that? So he invaded, yeah. got the line, then held a fake referendum yeah. to say, we all want to be Russia. So he then says, well, right, they're now Russia. So it's an annexation. Oh, I see. So they're saying, well, draw a line down there. We actually own that now. It's yeah. part of Russia. Which is what he did in Crimea in 2014. Bloody hell. Yeah. But, you know, people are at the ballot box at gunpoint being told to vote. So, it, you know, it's, it's meaningless. But it, the threat was then that any counterattack into those areas would be seen as an attack on Russia. And they keep sort of veiling this right, nuclear okay. threat. So he's saying, we now own this. So if Ukrainians come in now and say, we want this back, it looks like they're... They will, Putin will describe to his people that they're being invaded. That's that's right. the basic premise of it. And then, you know, that allows him to keep threatening the nuclear. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't say it outright, but that's his veiled threat. Any attack on the Russian homeland, we would escalate. So you're saying nuclear. I keep mm. hearing about this nuclear thing the whole time. Has he got the power to press one button to drop a nuclear bomb the distance to the UK if he wanted to? Um, I mean, technically... You know, the, the technology exists to do that. The The risk of a strategic nuke is almost zero. That's Armageddon, you know. So the moment that gets pressed, they all fire at each other. So that's that's like Armageddon. None of us need to worry about that because we won't be here, you know. So, the, But, but the, if, 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 sorry, sorry to interrupt here. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get my head around the, the mentality of this fellow, uh, Putin. Why, if he's losing the plot now and he feels like he's on the defence, he feels like the whole world's against him, mm -hmm. And all the big companies are pulled out of Russia and the kids aren't getting the stuff that they need these days, yeah. Instagram and Apple and da, da 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 all the stuff that are thinking, what is going on here? Surely Putin gets to a point at the age he's at and goes, you know what? Someone's going to come and get me and, yeah. and, and get me very soon. So why don't I just press the button and I'll leave my stamp for the rest of for the rest of history? We don't judge that he has the ability to do it on his own, like our okay. Prime doesn't, like the President of the United States doesn't. In what needs a team around him to say, yes, we'll do it with... Y yeah. But, but surely... Putin, <laughs> Putin being Putin, we go, right, you will work for me. I want you to agree. Yeah, we, we don't judge that to be a reality. Right, okay. You know, okay. Uh, we, we think he's losing losing grip in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg anyway. Yeah. Um, and that would probably be the final straw. When you say losing grip, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, the when he mobilised these 300 men, we yeah. saw riots breaking out. Yeah. We see people starting to flee the country. You know, there is information seeping into his sort of oppressive propaganda bubble. Yeah. So we don't think the grip he has on the Russian people is as strong as it was. And we've seen very prominent mayors speaking out against him as well. So even his political grip is starting to slip. Mm -hmm. He was um, supposedly in hiding the last couple of weeks at his uh, private secret ranch in Sochi, I think it is. So, you know, he's... <laughs> it's not that private. What room's he in? <laughs> 24B. 24B. <laughs> so, like, you know, we think he is losing grip because this, this conflict, he's put Russia in irreversibly... Yeah shit position yeah and you know he'll i'm sure he's lying awake at night thinking this yeah. is going bad have you seen him on telly do you think that he's changed over the past seven eight months with the pressure i don't know he's a he's a, a bit he's, shaky i think you get what you look for in that there was a lot of press about that he, they thought he had a tremor and they thought he had cancer i mean i hope he does but you know when we watch that 
I don't know if you saw it, but the big state parade to say they've annexed these four areas and saved yeah, them. Yeah. He looked on point. Yeah. You know, he looked confident. He's been in this a long time. He's a mm. KGB guy. He's yeah. adversarial by nature. Um, I still don't think that means he, get, he has the power to press a strategic nuke. The threat is more the tactical nukes. Um, and that's more what he's talking about when he talks about nuke. The sort of discrete nuclear attacks into different regions. Of Ukraine. Of Ukraine. Okay. But we deem that to be a very low possibility as And well. when you say a nuke, explain to me what a nuke is and how many people it can take out and what space mass it can go to. Um, I mean, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but it, it's essentially, it's a rocket, which is a delivery system with a nuclear warhead on it. So the explosion then causes radiation across the area, yeah. which then kills everything in that area. My God. Um, I mean, hugely destructive. And, um, what si and what size area can that go to? Depending on the size of the warhead, you know, it, it can take out city blocks to whole cities, to whole countries, right? Um, but much like the rest of his military, those nu those tactical nukes probably aren't in very good order. The, right. the vehicles that transport them probably aren't in very good order. NATO knows where they all are. So the moment they move, A, they're probably going to break down. Yeah. They're not going to be able to get in range of Ukraine. What would he achieve by firing it? Because he's going to kill his own troops, yeah. which he might do, but... What's he going to gain but from does it? But it sounds like he doesn't care whether he kills his own troops, right? If he's piling another 300,000, yeah, you're in prison, yeah, you're a baker, <laughs> yeah, you're a postman, get, yeah. get a gunfight in Ukraine. It seems like he doesn't really give a shit. He probably doesn't, but he he will also know that the moment they move and the moment they try to arm, A, there would be a preemptive strike against them because we know where they all are, but also that would spark um, more conventional attacks from NATO. He'd probably lose the Black Sea fleet immediately. You know, NATO would just wipe that out. You say the Black Sea fleet. That's his. That? That's his navy. Okay. Yeah, and you know it would be very easy for NATO to roll that over. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We all overestimated it. Okay. But now you know. Now everyone's delved a bit deeper. They're going. Okay, is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. There's there's no way Russia could withstand an assault from America, let okay. alone the rest of NATO. Okay. And you uh, and you say America and the UK are the strongest force there is if something happened. Um. I mean, it, it pains me to say the UK military in terms of size is not mm. what it was, but in terms of professionalism and experience, yeah, it's up there. What sort of size is it in the UK? I mean, Roughly. What, we're down to about 80,000, 90,000, 80, okay. I think. And the US? Oh, God, no, it's massive. Massive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the US Marine Corps alone is about 150,000. Wow, just and by they, itself. And they've got their own air force. You know, that's just the Marine Corps, yeah. you know, so... In terms of scale, they're incomparable. So, do you reckon Biden sits there and goes, "You know what? If something does kick off, we we can we can end this very quickly." Yeah, I mean, he he, he did say it pretty much that openly in a press conference of the day. Yeah. He said, "I'm warning you, Mr. Putin. You know, this will provoke strikes from us." And you know, the, I think if he if he moved exactly a nuke, if he if he did go to strike, you'd see the Black Sea Fleet get obliterated straight away. Straight away yeah. And when you say the Black Sea Fleet. They're all the big ships, right? Yeah. What about all the submarines that no one knows where they are underwater? Um, yes, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in submarine warfare either, but I'm, I'm fairly sure NATO would be able to deal with that as well. Well, they'll be able to hunt them down as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, technologically, NATO, certainly with America as the main partner in that, are so far advanced compared right, to okay. Russia. Yeah. How mad is a submarine? <laughs> I've never been on one. No, I but do you know what I mean? But I'm, you think about it, you're underwater. No one knows where you are. You can pop up and go, bang, missile, land, pop back down, and off you go again. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. I mean, I never really fancied spending six months of the year underwater. <laughs> no, nor do I. Yeah. Is there a lot of corruption going on? There's a lot of money being sent over to Ukraine. How do we mm. know all that money is being used in the right areas? Yeah, I mean, Ukraine has has a legacy to overcome. You know, it was Soviet. It, it was an oligarch state. And it's very bureaucratic because the bureaucracy and the difficulty to get anything done uh, allows for corruption to take place. You can get things done much quicker if you just pay this. Yeah. But it's so, it's so systemic sometimes. It doesn't always feel like corruption. It just feels like a tax or a fee to pay. Mm. Um, but it's a problem they have to overcome because if they are going to move towards EU and NATO membership, they're going to have to get rule of law and they're going to have to overcome corruption. Mm. Um, in terms of the money that's gone to Ukraine, mm. it hasn't actually come in the form of money. It's come in the form of material. Okay. Um, Example? Well, like America didn't give them $40 billion. Mm. It gave them $40 billion's worth, worth of weapons. Of, yeah. yeah. Uh, same with logistics, food, aid, that kind of thing. Um, but it takes some navigating. You have to understand, you have to make 
partnerships with the right people that can help you navigate the corruption. So you need to find people of influence that are anti-corruption and are progressive in thinking that have like the the sway to get things through. Because um, there's there'll still be some people in Ukraine that will want the corruption because they make a lot of money out of it. Mm. Have you have you seen on the streets? Obviously, you have seen on the streets of Ukraine. Have you seen many uh, everything sort of your tanks blown up and sat there all the Russian tanks? Have you seen dead bodies on the side of the road? What does it look like? Does it get cleared up, or is it just it's there? It's going to stay there for a while because we're more concentrating pushing the Russians back. Yeah. So the um, lots of tanks. I've seen lots of blown up tanks, and they actually did a big uh, a big clearance of loads of ones around Kiev mm. for Independence Day, and they did a they sort of. Uh, what do you call it? Celebrated, like a display like, yeah, in, in the center of Kiev of yeah. all the blown up Russian tanks. I mean, T-92s, we were scared of T-92s forever. We thought these were these undefeatable tanks. There's blokes with 400 pound rocket launchers taking them out. So, <laughs> And unfortunately, yeah, um, again, in the earlier days, seeing lots of the, conv they were not convoys, they were like civilian yeah. escape, um, just traffic jams that had just been vittled up and, you know, unfortunately civilians that lost their lives before they've been cleaned up and, and taken away. How powerful has the Klitschko brothers been in this whole situation? Yeah, so I, I met uh, I met Vitaly yeah. a few weeks ago. Uh, he's massive. Yeah, he's a he's lump, massive. isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he is huge. Um, he's been very important. Um, Vladimir as well, but obviously Vitaly is the mayor of Kiev. So he uses not just his political position, but also his stature as a boxer yeah. to go around the world to keep attention yeah. on the war. Um, and you know, different military commanders will phone him needing things and he'll then go out into his network and his connections to try and get things into the country. Mm. And of course, both of them didn't need to stay in terms of they had the wealth yeah. and the ability to be anywhere. Yeah. And they both, well, yeah. Vitaly was there, Vladimir came back in and they yeah. stayed there during the invasion. Yeah. You know, they're strong like warriors. They're really iconic yeah. Ukrainians. Absolutely, yeah. fighting for their country. Yeah. And protecting Kiev. If Trump, was still in power, what do you think he would do right now? Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh mate, I, I have no idea. Because then you've got two loose cannons at yes. the top, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I can never really judge if Putin, if Trump is pro-Putin or anti-Putin. Because mm. um, sometimes it's like they were the best of friends yeah. and Trump was almost a puppet for Putin. Then there's other times when he... You know, he, he says that he'd have just ended the war all the time. I I don't think, my gut says, if Trump was still in power, America wouldn't have responded as well. Really? My gut. Okay. My gut. And I wasn't really prepared for that question, but I, th I think, I do think the Trump-Putin relationship, there's more to that. Um and I don't think it had been as strong because there's a there's a narrative appearing in the states. I, I work there quite a bit still. Um, that's pro Russia because they see Putin as standing up for the homeland and standing up for the right and, and this anti left, anti woke. It's a bizarre twist, yeah. but there is this belt in America that is pro Putin because they see that it's like the gun laws and the pro life mm. and and Putin. You know, it's like that really extreme right. Yeah. Um, and I think Putin would have. Uh, I think Trump may have gone down that line. Mm. I reckon it'd been dangerous if I'm honest with you. I mean, too lunatic. Too loons. Yeah. But I reckon. Do you think Putin made the call on this, knowing that uh, Trump wasn't in charge? Do you reckon that'd have been part of it? I mean, yeah. I mean, we could theorise about it. Mm. Um, potentially, I don't think Putin would have given Trump that much respect. I think. I again, this is a gut. I think Putin probably thought he had Trump in his pocket. Do you um, I do. Okay. I do. Two massive egos, right? Huge egos. Mm. Who probably both thought they had each other in yeah, the Yeah, I agree. That's what yeah. I'm about to say. Yeah. Like the worst game of poker. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, <laughs> They're shit. They're both going all in. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, what do you think's the, what do you think's the, the way forward right now for both of these countries? Is it Russia's just going to come back and want to take over the whole of Ukraine? But surely Russia must be sitting there going, well, the whole world is going to go against us if we go again. We've had our, we've had our, we, we, we got invaded, we stepped back. Is there any chance of Putin could say, let's just stay in our country right now? The, the problem is Putin's put them in an irreversible position, which they're losing very badly. Now, if Putin loses that war, he loses control of Russia 
and that's the end of his presidency and probably the end of his life. Yeah. You know, and he will know that because okay. he's been doing this for a long time. Okay. He's been assassinating people a long, long time. He's been assassinating people, Of course, he? yes. You know. For years. They, the KGB, you know, they've been assassinated. He yeah. assassinated his way to the top, essentially. Mm. You know, you either get poisoned or you fall out of a window. Mm. So he's probably cooking his own food and not going near windows for a while. Yeah. But you're in a, they're in a fourth generation battle right now. So there's been losses on both sides, huge losses on both sides, and huge losses of equipment. And war is about logistics and fourth generation. Mm. So the quicker you can replenish what you're losing in relation to your opponent, mm. the better your position is. So if you're if you're attacking Ukraine and you are thousands of miles into 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 the country, mm. but you can't replenish fuel and food and everything else for your soldiers, the only way you can go is backwards. Yes, I mean that's logistics. Yes. Fourth generation is about the people and the weapons. So you're losing soldiers, you're losing equipment. Yeah. You have to be training and equipping at the speed, if not quicker, than than you're losing. Mm. And Russia is losing the fourth generation battle right now because they're conscripting people, they're not training them, they don't have the equipment to give them, mm. and they're not fighting behind a moral component because they don't care about the war. They're conscripted men. Yeah. We're seeing them retreat, you know, full scale retreat yeah. the moment there's a Ukrainian counteroffensive. Mm. On the flip of that, you've got Ukraine that is forced mobilizing much quicker. They have volunteers coming forward to fight. They're training them better, and they are now drastically better equipped than Russia because of the weapons coming from wow. NATO. Okay. So initially, where it was all Russia and Russian equipment, yeah. the balance has shifted now, yeah. and it's now all about Ukraine's equipment. And they are employing the NATO weapons incredibly well. You know, the high Mars rocket systems, in particular, has been an absolute war changer. And what are they? Sorry, the rocket systems. Very long range, very okay. precise rocket systems. And they are they coming from tanks? No, they're, they're coming off sort of lorry mounted yeah. rocket launchers. They were given. Okay. They were donated by the states, but that gives Ukraine the ability to to attack logistic nodes in behind the Russian infantry. So this is what's really disrupted them. It's cutting off their ground lines of communications, their G locks. Yeah. So that's all the logistics chains, the ammunition dumps. It means they can strike into Crimea. Right. So we saw Crimea getting hit three weeks ago. Yeah. You know That's because of these new weapon systems. Um, so Ukraine's gone from an army that was very focused on trench warfare since 2014 to one that is now engaging very well in the combined arms battle. So they're mm. understanding how to layer soldiers with artillery, with long range weapons, yeah. with air assets. So, you know, that they've expanded the battle space, yeah. whereas Russia's battle space is getting smaller because yeah. they're losing equipment Fantastic. and they can't force generate quick Fantastic. enough. Fantastic. And when it got announced the other day that Putin was going to put 300,000 soldiers back in to war to push, to go against, um, to take on Ukraine again, there was a massive panic of everyone wanting to leave the country. Mm. Yeah, it's because all of a sudden there was all this support, yeah, we'll go liberate Ukraine. And then there's these blokes sitting in Russia going, oh, fuck, yeah. this could be me now. This could be me, yeah. And, you know, and whilst they they may be ignorant they may be brainwashed they're not completely stupid yeah. they realize they're going to fight in that war where there's body bags coming back every day statistically speaking they're going to be in one of those body yeah. bags and those three hundred thousand, i guarantee will just get fed into a meat grinder they won't last two minutes yeah okay and the people wanted to leave the country what country are they allowed to go to well that's i mean that's quite dynamic isn't it so, i mean they were all rushing into georgia which ironically russia invaded in 2008 um but Lots of European cities, uh, lots of European countries are, have been banning visas for for any Russian. Yeah. So they they've got limited places to go now. Georgia, they'll be getting to the Emirates if they've got the money to. Yeah. Again, it depends on money. Yeah. Um, like if you wanted to flee, you could probably go almost wherever you wanted. But mm. if you're a binman, yeah, you, your your options are limited. So lots of the wealthy will be in the uh, Arab Emirates right now, places like that. But the average Joe is going to get mobilised. Do you think there's people in the US and the UK who are the creme de la creme hunting down Putin to get rid of him? Um, I mean, it would be foolish to think that that's not on certain people's workflow, right? Um, I just don't know logistically. How, it's not just logistically. Toppling the regime doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Mm. You know, in Iraq, we toppled Saddam, didn't we? Mm. And that that actually got worse. Yeah. Um, you cut the head off that snake, there's two things that could happen. Russia could disintegrate and be like, we're finally free. Or, you know, depending on how the narrative goes, they'll see that as another Western attempt to change a regime yeah. that they didn't like. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm... Could that backfire? Yeah. I'm pretty yeah. confident that 
the West has probably learned a lot of lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of like regime change. Yeah. We don't do it very well. And also how that's received on the other end. Not everyone wants to be free of Putin. Mm. In fact, the majority probably don't want to be, especially from America or the UK, who they've grown up to think is the enemy. Mm. So I don't think killing him is the answer. Um, and I suspect our governments probably think the same thing. Mm. Even talking of regime, regime change is very dangerous. Zelensky mentioned it uh, a couple of days ago. He said, we're now ready to talk to Russia, but not to that president. Is that right? Yeah. And it's I really time. like that Zelensky. Yeah. Cool, huh? What a cool guy, yeah. yeah. Do you know he was a comedian or something oh, no. before he'd become president? TV comedian, TV yeah. comedian. No, no political background. But I'm just real. so charismatic and was just what they needed at that time. Yeah. When people were offering him um, sanctuary, he was like, I don't need a flight, I need ammunition. Yeah. And he was out on the front line, yeah. you know. And he, he galvanised, you know, the, the West into Ukraine and he galvanised Ukraine. Mm. And... I mean, how many other world leaders would have no, done what he's done? No. Yeah, amazing. Most of them would have bottled it. Yeah, for sure. Mm. And for you personally, you've been out there for how long? Seven and a half months now. And where'd you keep? Um, <laughs> for a long time, I, I didn't stay in one place for more than two days. So, you know, constantly in different places. If we're in if we're in Kiev and Lviv, we just stay in bed and breakfast or hotels. Yeah. I had an apartment for a while in Lviv. Okay. When we're out east, you know, just we just sleeping wherever we can. There's lots of deserted buildings. Um, we tuck up in there with people. We, we sleep with um, different units. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a it's a country of two halves right now. Yeah. Like east and west. Yeah. In the west, it's really nice. Yeah, really and nice. And you say in the west, there are there uh, are most kids, mums, wives, sisters all left the country. Yes, yeah, so there was the mass exodus in yeah. the first. It, there was day long queues, well, more than day, you know, days and days long queues to get out. Um, and it was in the snow, you know, people were freezing mm. and you know, people did die in those queues. Mm. But then there was queues to get back in after about six, eight weeks, I think. Um, oh, they wanted to come back in and say, okay, it's calmed down a bit. Yeah, because okay. it's their homes, everything the owners there, their families. God, imagine, just imagine having to leave, like now our homes and, and, and our families leaving us to go, right, we're going to go, we're going mm. to. France and we'll, yeah. us lot are all going to fight or whatever. I'm sure you love it personally. But <laughs> I'm not sure it's my cup of tea. <laughs> I like Sky Sports on a Saturday yeah, and yeah, yeah, have yeah. the pals round. <laughs> yeah. But it would be a shock. But again, if you needed to do that for your country, your mind just changes. I, I certainly would be fighting for my own country if that happened. Yeah, of course you would. Yeah, um, And most people would. But mate, we saw some heartbreaking stuff in the early days where yeah. we'd go into a certain area to get a family out, yeah. evacuate them from the Bendy area, get them through the country with the with the father or the whoever the male in the family was then we get to the border and we'd watch them have to say goodbye oh man and that family a the females didn't know where they were going yeah. or the young boys b they didn't know if they were ever going to see their dad or the brother again and my, my fucking heartbreaking my. um and then yeah i just yeah it, it's like the worst thing yeah i think it's worse than any of the violence we've ever seen is watching these family units get split get split mm. apart um so it's no wonder then once it was safe enough, they wanted to come back yeah. to at least be back in the same country. And not all have, you know. I've got lots of Ukrainian friends now and they they wear, it's like, if you're just chatting to someone in a cafe or a bar, they're traumatized as a, as a, as a people, you mm. know. It's not just the soldiers feeling this trauma, it's yeah. all of them. Because they were living a life like we live, you know. Yeah. And now there's war and they saw war and their friends, their families, they've all experienced loss and it's going to take them a generation to get over this. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. But it's also the unknown, not knowing what a lunatic could do. Yeah. That's the, that, that's the bit for me. I'm thinking, my God, you, you, someone's on the border. You don't know what he's going to do next. But it's not just Putin. I think this is the point we've got. Like, Putin is obviously a lunatic and he started all this. But those Russian soldiers are making a choice every day to do what they're doing. Yeah, but they, they haven't got a choice, Sharpie. They, they, they haven't got a choice in the fight. They have to fight it, the raping of babies, the butchery, the torture. Like, there is, I was a soldier, like, I understand what orders are and I understand what the next level is. Yeah. And and these these soldiers are making choices. Just cold-hearted, not just giving a shit. Scumbags. Yeah, okay. Like, murderous, rapist yeah. scumbags. My God. Yeah. And for you, Sharpie, on a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> are we going to the boozer? <laughs> yeah, we'll leave my face. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mate, I really do appreciate you coming on and, and explaining everything that's going on from the front mm -hmm. line. And 
for you to spend seven and a half months in Ukraine, mate, that's that's that takes some doing, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I've just I've just got my three year residency, so I'm not I'm not done yet. We've got some more work to do yet. Is that right? Yeah, we can do with the misses. <laughs> yeah. Save that for the booze. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping she'll still be here. When still I get be, back. Yeah. <laughs> Sharpie, I really do appreciate you coming on, mate. No, thanks for having me, mate. Yeah, an absolute pleasure. And uh, it's really uh, heartwarming to what you've uh, gone and done the last seven and a half months. You're yeah. su- su- super proud of yourself. Cheers, Dodge. Wicked. Good thanks, man. Mate. Cheers, mate. Yeah, Thank you. Good,